You're listening to Scaling Impact, the number one podcast for conscious entrepreneurs changing the world. Today on the podcast, we're bringing you our first foundational knowledge episode. These episodes are designed to give entrepreneurs practical knowledge and actionable steps to both scale their business and their positive impact. In this episode, I'm joined by my co-founder of Exponential Ventures, James Wallace. Since we're both named James, I tend to go by JT and he goes by JW. So JW has been an entrepreneur since he was 11 years old and has built hundreds of applications in over 25 tech startups. He built his first website in 1994 and hasn't stopped building technology since. He's an exponential technology specialist and a brilliant advisor when it comes to building exponential organizations. In this episode, we talk about the three Ps, passion, purpose, and proficiency, specifically what they are, why they matter, and why we won't invest in founders who don't have them, regardless of how lucrative the project is. We also explain how traditional accelerators are broken and neglect 95% of companies they accept but don't feel have unicorn DNA. Finally, we look at how to get a founder to uncover and connect with the deeper why behind their business and how powerfully that serves them in the long run. Interesting points covered include how to get to the why behind your business, the three Ps every founder needs and every investor wants to see, the story of Thrive Market, a case study for the three Ps in action, why founders forget to have fun with their financials and what it really costs them, and unicorn DNA and why it's broken most accelerators. So I wanted to bring you on. We haven't had this chance very often. We talk to founders all the time about um, passion, purpose, proficiency. We talk about them discovering their why or their purpose. Um, But we haven't actually sat down to create content or collect some of this information, these ideas into some kind of a curriculum or at least a string of ideas. And so I thought today we could talk about it together, co-create that. Um, but, and I'll, but I'll also do a little bit of interviewing. So uh, for those listening that don't know James Wallace, he's my business partner, co-founder of Exponential University, uh, Exponential Ventures, and the fund that we're creating. So let's jump into discovering clarity and what that means. What do you think that that means when you come into someone, maybe at a at Startup Fest, a young founder comes up to you and they're saying, you know, um, I want to create this company. It's exploiting this little loophole. I'm going to make 6% on every transaction. That's why I'm going to do it. And you're trying to get to the root of what do they actually want to do? How do you get them to their why? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a really, really tough thing to do. I think when you ask, you know, 99% of founders why, they'll give you some sort of market intelligence or, you know, something that they've perceived as an opportunity based on, maybe even their own perception, um, not even a lot of study necessarily. And that's the beginning, I guess. And then you continue to ask more questions. Why are you uniquely equipped to, to tackle this challenge? And I think at that point, starting to introduce the person to the problem they're trying to solve allows for the beginning of the beginning of the conversation. But the point is most founders have never even really considered their personal aspect or you know, again, unique ability, their their spirit, their their purpose, they've not connected those things with the business that they're running. Right. Uh, so when it comes to proficiency, like say with some of our, you know, awesome entrepreneur friends, we go to a, a private mastermind or a group, uh, you have these people, they've all made a bunch of money doing something. And what I realized when I was in one of these groups for the first, one of the first times, is I realized everyone here knows their superpowers to a certain degree, because they've made a bunch of success or money by doing something. And so that was the thing that made it really easy for me to help advise people on how to get closer to their purpose was because I know it's proficiency. What's your comments on proficiency? Well, I think what you're good at is just part of the equation. <laughs> and, you know, society education teaches us that's almost the entire equation. What are you good at? Uh, whatever you're good at, go do it. Uh, go create a living, create a business. And that's, again, just part of it. So. Um, what you're good at, what you're excited about, what you find meaning in, you know, the trifecta, getting all those things arranged in a way, um, is, and then connecting that with the business obviously is a, is a much better uh, path or connection to the business. But the proficiency aspect is critical. You, you know, unless you're good at it or have a plan to get good at it very quickly, you know, you're not going to experience what we would call success. And, and a lot of the time we build companies around the founder where we see, oh, wow, you're you're world class at this and you're actually quite horrible at these other things. Let's build the company so it doesn't do those other things. 
that you're not capable at. And let's focus everything on this one really valuable thing that you can contribute. So we build it around their proficiency a lot of the time. Um, and you said excited about, so you started to talk about passion. And, and I know you came up with this triple P concept a while back, uh, proficiency, passion, and purpose. Uh, so getting into passion, proficiency tends to tell us, especially if you're a little bit more um, mature or if you've, you're more experienced as an entrepreneur, you've figured out what you're good at and what you're not good at to, to a certain degree. And that leads you toward the things that ultimately people will pay more money for. So the, and you've, you've honed your value. Hey, when I do this for one hour, I get paid more. That means I can provide a lot more value in that one hour than I can doing this other thing. So it, automatically there's a bit of a product market fit that starts to happen between the person's value they create in the world and how they're getting paid. And they start to see that happen. So they, they start to hone it. When it gets to passion, that's something that a lot of people think is superfluous or something that they don't need, uh, you know, just grind it out, hustle it up. What do you think? Well, I think I think that that the purpose part, the meaning part, you know, to me, if I jump to the end and then come back, it's something you can do forever. You know, when you find meaning in something, you don't need some sort of financial or practical justification for it. You just go do it. Um, where it might be a bit of a challenge without the the excitement part, the passion part, um, or, or I, I should say, when there's passion there and excitement, I think you can accelerate the contribution, you know, whatever you're doing. And I think a good example of that would be, say, someone that finds tremendous meaning in some sort of charitable contribution. You know, that meaningful feeling that they get when they do that action, if it's absent the passion and the excitement, they'll continue to do it, of course, but probably to a lesser degree. Maybe it's a burnout. Like they really, let's say they're tackling homelessness and they just, you get to the point where you're just so, you're suffering yourself, you're in pain, you're exhausted and so the contribution you make to that meaningful thing that purposeful thing is diminished dramatically by not having that excitement and passion so i think that the passion is one of the things that can kind of come in and out it oscillates around uh, proficiency is established in the passion um, oscillates in and out and and the purpose al is always maintained but yeah i would just simply say that if you're currently excited about that thing that you're also purposeful about you will just you know in that time period really accelerate your your contribution mm -hmm. And I remember we went to see Jason Silva speak in Toronto and he mentioned at one point, uh, it wasn't his concept, but he just, uh, that, this is where we heard it. And he said, if you lined up all the things you're curious about and listed 10 things you were curious about and then figured out how they kind of spliced together and put like four or five on top of each other, then that would create a passion. So if you had five different things you were curious about, it would kind of compound to the point of a passion as one way to find it. A lot of people that are entrepreneurs used to have regular jobs and it was ridiculous like it, there wouldn't be a job out there typically that you could find that you're proficient at that you're passionate about and that you that was ultimately fulfilling you in your purpose and so it's a foreign concept for a lot of people to be able to get one or two of those let alone three in the same venture or in the same job uh, but when you're an entrepreneur you get to create choose your own adventure uh, so why not create these things and we'll get in a minute why investors like to see these three why uh, how it helps you build a tribe, all these different components that are very practical as to why you have to do this. It's, it's very just practical. Um, but also, why not do it? It's going to make it more fun. It's going to make it more exciting. It's going to let your true self come out more at your work and attract people that you like to work with, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so if someone says, like, you know, they're creating a tax saving software and you say, what's your passion? They're like, saving taxes. You know, what do you say to that? How do you get deeper than the initial? Because a lot of people do that. They'll say, well, I'm so passionate about, you know, um, dog grooming, you know, and, and the way that, you know, this product can really solve this problem for people that are doing dog, dog grooming. And you're like, yeah, but there, there's got to be something more to it. That doesn't sound like a passion. I don't even hear you getting excited. So what's, how do you lead them through a conversation? Well, and it can be very difficult. So again, people are so divorced and detached from that even being a reality, a possibility, an invitation. They don't feel that they even have permission. They feel that they constantly have to justify the very you know financial, practical reality of the business. So it, the first thing is to give them permission to say, hey, so okay, let's put that aside for a second. Let's say you have a very you know profitable, viable business model. What's the part that really gets you excited? And, and again, a lot of people, sometimes you have to drag them through this process but once they start to to realize and 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 the excitement starts it's a snowball but i but 
I would typically try you to see get the little jump. Start, beginning of a smile and sure. you're like, oh, they're breaking, yeah. they're breaking their usual pattern. Yeah. You know, we're getting them off script. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's the first part. So sometimes actually the way that I do it personally, sometimes come in and very abruptly shake it up. Right. Uh, and it could be just some sort of like amazing uh, uh, feeling or, or idea or bait around permission and excitement. And sometimes it's really calling them out on how, how narrow vision they are and, and how short sighted they are. Uh, so it can be kind of aggressive if need be, but typically I think the, the best way to do this is to have them jump to the end and say, put, us, put aside the whole story that you've told yourself and you tell your investors and you tell your employees, tell me what is that moment in time where you know you've succeeded. And so if it's a dog grooming uh, business, the person may describe uh, in the end when they hand the dog over to the owner and the owner is extremely proud and the dog jumps up and it can be petted and sniffed and rolled with. If it's a tax software, it's that the family has found the ability to go on the vacation they didn't know that they could go on, right? And we, so once you allow them to just own what it is that actually excites them, actually, to be clear, a lot of people don't have that can't find that and that's where we find the problem. That's when we introduce, there's a lack of passion, a lack of purpose and we have a, a fundamental problem in your business. But it, assuming that is there, now all of a sudden they understand the point of it. The point of it is not to create tax software or dog grooming, it's to enable something in someone else's life. And then what we find obviously is that people can then take that really exciting story, understand it themselves, be able to jump out of bed when they know they have a tough day ahead mm -hmm. with a lot more energy and feed that back into stakeholders, employees, and so on to get them excited about why they're doing what they're doing. Right. Yeah. And do, does the investor or does the person they're telling about their passion believe them is, mm -hmm. the, is the real question. Like, do I really believe that when it gets really, really hard, you're going to keep doing this? And, and we'll get into that in a second in terms of investors. But so when you can kind of, we've talked about proficiency being the primary clue to where your purpose lies. Uh, you know, there's something there, there's something really valuable that you're doing, you're doing it naturally, you've been able to optimize around it. Wow, I'm really good at this. And people are really needing it and they keep giving me a bunch of money to do it. Okay, now there's, a, there's part of it that I hate doing and there's part of it that I love doing. So now they've, they've figured that out and they're like, well, what if I had an assistant that could help me with all this stuff over here? Or what if I just had a service provider I could utilize? That could that could do this. You know, send my invoices out and do my expenses and get a bookkeeper to do that. And then I could do, be on set more as a videographer. Or I could be doing more public speaking as opposed to crunching numbers on my computer about my speaking gigs um, and do more of what I love. And they start to see the the business case for it, where it's like, oh, if I did more of what I love, I would get more money for those hours, and then I would be able to easily afford an assistant or a you know one of those other things, a bookkeeper. So then we get into passion and we're drilling down more to like the core of where the emotion comes from that they can connect with their work or their proficiency. And now they're, they're you know, there's public speakers on stage all the time. They're living the dream. Like this is what they would want to do. They didn't think you could do it. They have a support team that's helping them out. And, and after a year or two, that might get pretty boring. It might start to wane and then the passion fumbles a little bit or they start speaking for audiences they don't like and then they become... Uh, kind of curious what, what's next you know do I quit speaking or is there just something that's a little off that needs more alignment uh, alignment is a key term so then we get into purpose how would you define purpose and I think it's going deeper one is very almost superficial like what do you do kind of a thing proficiency and then there's the passion and then the purpose and when we get to purpose then you start getting into really deep stuff. A friend of ours, Philip McKernan, uh, who we've done another interview for on the podcast, he specializes in this and it's not as easy as, he says people pay him a whole bunch of money to tell them, to tell them what they don't want to hear. <laughs> so, and, and ultimately they do need, but it's not something that they always want. It, and it has to do with like sometimes core wounds or things that like we're silly, silly screwed up. Where does our passion come from? The, like force creates counterforce, and I feel like passion is a is a counterforce to something that was created. Uh, sometimes something you know, um, a friend of ours who makes something to do with pets. I remember him getting to a point where he was like, "Oh my gosh, I never even realized this," and I think everyone around him realized it before he did. Which was like, "How did you get into this? Why does it matter so much?" And it came down to him having a pet when he was younger and having that pet kind of, uh, I think it was abused. And there was a, a serious problem that he, he wanted to stand up for these animals and do something meaningful 
to contribute back to these animals. And he never had, had attached the fact that he built this whole business to do with pet stuff related to this core thing from when he was a kid where he didn't you know, feel like he had a lot of support and he had this awesome product in mind that he did amazing with, he had a proficiency in, he had passionate about. And we were, he was kind of saying the type of thing where I don't, I don't know if I really have that purpose or if I found that thing, you know? And we could see that it was there somehow, but we couldn't figure out quite what it was. And it came up in a discussion just about um, the past. So where have you seen that come up with? Um, have you seen good examples? Instead of getting into the theory, what are some tactile examples of entrepreneurs where you've been able to see their passion kind of come up? Or sorry, their purpose. Well, actually, you see it. Uh, how do you know when you're in love? You know when you're in love, right? This is one of these things that's ineffable, indescribable. And I think that you, 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 you see it when you see it. And, and you can just feel it. You know, you feel when someone's in their purpose. Um, everything becomes effortless. It becomes timeless. You just, you, you just know it. So it's hard to not get into the theory of it. So let me just say the thing. And you just described flow state to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting sign, alpha brain waves, flow state mm -hmm. uh, of alignment. Yeah. An alignment between something I don't think we, we truly understand. So the way that I describe it often is that, um, you know, we don't know where we came from, how we got here, why we're here, where we go when we die. Uh, anyone that thinks that they know that is applying faith. And I'm not saying that that faith is incorrect, but the most uh, honest description of this life of this experience is exactly that. We don't know where we came from, how we got here, why we're here, or where we go. And I would suggest that the purpose part of proficiency, passion, and purpose is the human spirit finding the connection to the thing that they came here to do. So the, truly the life's purpose. And again, because you know, what surrounds us in this third dimension is so unknowable, so much of it, you know, even the alignment of that purpose the human spirit to something much greater. Mm -hmm. It's just something that we can't you know, architect a strategy toward necessarily. We can't describe it when we're in it. Just like I said, how hard it is to describe love, how hard it is to actually create a, a practical objective strategy to find love. No, you just have to, you know, I'm not even gonna get into describing it. It's just impossible mm -hmm. to do that. Um, so we take hints, you know, we advise, founders to, to open their minds up a little bit. We invite them to consider what's possible. We give them permission. We explain anything's possible. Uh, we ask them to follow little leads when they get excited, follow their instinct, their gut, uh, uh, listen to people that they care about, their observations and so on. So it is really you know, something that is hard to strategize your way into. You more or less have to feel your way into it. And then once you get there, like when you're in love, you know you're there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit like silence too. Some things you can only hear when there's silence for enough time to hear it. Mm -hmm. So like going out and reading a whole bunch of books, talking to, you know, just scrolling social media to try to find your purpose, uh, you know, just different things like that. They're not going to really work. It's not really an active thing. It's more a passive that you'd like discover or uncover. And that's why I thought like for today, it's about uncovering or discovering is kind of what it feels like a lot of the time, clarity. Um, but, you know, even Philip McKernan would say, you have perfect clarity. It's just, hazy with a whole bunch of stuff you have in front of it uh you know things that are distracting you and when the silence kind of comes or when you can kind of take some time or have some shakeups in your life you kind of end up having to be aligned or having the option to be aligned <laughs> i totally agree and i think you know i feel very fortunate that the world is beginning to wake up where this is even possible to have this conversation but the reality still is the world constructed around us is not designed to help us with this it's designed to to help us maintain a certain role in society as a worker, as a father, as a friend. Um, it's not, and, the, and that whole society is extremely interdependent and requires, you know, proper behavior within it. And it feels very threatened when, when we misbehave. But misbehavior is the exact thing that I think helps people to find that spot. So it could be long walks in nature. It could be taking space from work, a sabbatical, or working three days a week instead of five. Um, it could be standing up for ourselves with our friends and family, saying we're no longer going to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. We're going to focus on ABC. All of these things are wildly unfavorable in society, mm -hmm. uh, but exactly the things that we need to create 
you know, the connection to ourselves, the, you know, uh, awareness, just the ability to sense information. I think we're programmed many ways to block out this, this key information. Well, and that's the reason that we're hitting up entrepreneurs with this challenge is because if anyone's going to take it on, it's going to be the people that have already opted out of typical jobs, people that have opted out of, you know, a lot of um, the, the norms that most people have done. And so they're already, it's almost like a... Um, uh, pre-qualification that they're an entrepreneur it's like okay so you you didn't do what your parents told you to do i like that <laughs> uh, we got another challenge for you <laughs> don't do what society wants you to do or what you know startup um, magazines or tv shows tell you you're supposed to do uh, it's not just about scaling companies and selling them uh, endless times actually we have some friends like that and they're really depressed you know and what are they doing exactly what we're telling you to do right now why don't you get a head start <laughs> Um, okay, so purpose. I wanted to get a, a, a nice example out of you, though, on a situation you've seen where someone had that happen. Because a lot of people, you know, it's it's hard to imagine what happens when the lights go on and you find your purpose in a certain company, whether you're already been running the company or not. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't always happen before you launch. It can happen along the way. I could just mention quickly uh, with uh, the company that I was running that was making audiobooks, there was a time period where I realized that one of my core wounds was about not being heard or, you know, my voice not being heard or not feeling like I had a voice. And then I realized that the whole company was built on like giving people a voice. And, it, and someone told me that oftentimes that's the way it works with entrepreneurs where they, uh, it's almost like they're doing the exact opposite thing that their inner critic is telling them. And so if my inner critic was telling me, you have no voice, then I went out and I said, screw that. I'm going to, I have a voice and I'm going to make it for everyone else too. And, but I wasn't even aware of that until later in the game when I was like, oh, this kind of makes sense why I'm so passionate about this or why I care so much about letting other people have their voice heard, whether it's audiobook narrators or authors or people like that. Um, so that was a big one for me. It, I would love to, to share a lot um, of these examples, but the reason why I'm hesitating, I'm understanding right now is because it's deeply personal. Mm -hmm. So I don't, like I can think of someone that dropped a very conventional business and bought a bus and drives it around, you know, the world essentially. I think there's someone else that was running an e-commerce platform that sold that to sell in a circular economy. So reusable, recyclable gear and moved halfway across the country. But why they did it is not for me to share. You know, right. that is, like I said, a deeply, deeply personal thing. And it's for exactly the reason that you said, it's right beside their deepest wound, mm. which is, um, again, not for me to share, but. Well, actually I have one that I could share because I heard it at a conference. Uh, the guy who came up with Thrive, uh, Thrive Market in the States, uh, it's still relatively small, but I heard about it before it launched. Uh, the guy was talking about it and Bill Clinton had already signed off on it and supported it in some way. And some other big notable people were really saying it was great. And the guy came up and he shared his passion, purpose, proficiency. He said, I know how to make online scalable businesses, uh, specifically in like consumer products. I've, I've created a business and I've sold it. Now I have some cash. That was like proficiency. And then he said passion. He's like, I want to create something like Whole Foods, except I want it to be half the cost. Uh, of, of what you get pay at Whole Foods so it's more accessible to more people and I want it to be delivered right to your door so you don't even have to go out and shop. And I was like, whoa, that's, that's quite the passion. And then he shared purpose. He said he grew up as a person with, and it was a very compelling pitch because it was all the, the whole package for what you would look for in, in an opportunity and as an investor or just, I was like, this guy's definitely gonna do it. And the third thing was that when he was growing up, his mom was, they were very poor and he had a single mom and she had to decide do I buy good food for my kids? Or um, I think she had like that option and, or something else like, you know, have proper clothing or things like that. And she chose the good food. So she chose to give her kids on, you know, a meager income, organic food and high quality things. She didn't want to put this other stuff into her kids. And it was almost impossible for someone on a limited income to do that. And he said, I'm going to eliminate that. I'm going to eliminate that threat from other people in the same scenario. And so and then you're like, oh, this guy's definitely going to do it. He's got all this alignment. He definitely has a passion for it. He has a real solid reason that when things get hard, he's going to push through. Um, so that was a really cool story that I heard. Uh, and then later on deduced the fact that, wow, that was his passion, purpose, proficiency and everything. Uh, in the summer, we went to Startup Fest and we were asked to do a talk on um, 
I forget what they asked us to talk about. We changed the talk. It was something about like um, what investors want. And so we said, okay, we'll work with that title and we'll attract a whole bunch of people that want to, they want to first of all, talk to us because we're investors. Then they want to find out what we're looking for and what, how to win. Oh, there's a pitch competition going on. And we knew there would be a bunch of people that were going to lose. And so I think part of the talk title was something about um, why the best companies don't win pitch competitions. And it was just about like what you're not doing right. And so we started getting into all this stuff and they formed a nice big circle kind of around us. We sat on the grass. It was a very informal thing, but within a few minutes you could tell they'd never been talked to the way that we were talking to them. They had never been uh, told what investors are actually looking for. And they were guessing the whole time and they were guessing wrong. You want to talk about some of the things that we went into in that discussion? Yeah. I mean, something that's not perfectly relevant, but I think is really important to say, uh, perfectly relevant to this conversation, but really important to say is to, is in one of my big um, things that I'm a huge proponent of is to not pitch at all. And so, you know, the investor is just a part of uh, the, the, the group. It's a part of the, what makes it possible, what makes it happen, a little bit of capital, a little bit of advice. And so it's always a conversation. It's always saying, hey, I'm uniquely equipped. And I guess this rolls into part two, the second half that is really relevant to the conversation, which is really stating why you, right? Why are you uniquely equipped to, to, to solve this problem? And it is a combination of proficiency, passion, and purpose. And I think the purpose side, the purpose end that is this so, so important is that if, if, if the um, example they just gave, solving a problem because I had a problem as a child, my mom couldn't, that is so convincing. First of all, you're indicating that you are part of the target market. You're explaining in vivid detail the pain of that. But because you are so attached to not having another mom, another family, another son experience that thing, the investor will ultimately get to, consciously or unconsciously, this person is the person to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Well, and that was one of the questions that I brought to the people. So you started the whole conversation with, first of all, don't pitch. It creates a power imbalance, and that's not fair to you as a company. If you actually are good at what you're doing, then you deserve to be talking to these investors. And they were just like... That was the first sentence or two. <laughs> uh, and then we got into the whole topic about, um, uh, what was it you just mentioned there? Um, about the, why are you uniquely? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so I could tell they weren't quite getting it. And so I think I threw in one comment there and the lights seemed to go on for a few of the people that weren't. And I said, okay, so as an investor, we're seeing four people pitch the same company. Why are you the one that we should invest in? And they were like, oh, I'd never thought of that that you're actually getting pitches all the time for similar things and that we're literally trying to figure out which one do you bet on, you know, kind of like a horse race, you know, which one seems like the best one of all the ones to, to bet on. And we just see that um, trajectory. Whereas the person that comes up and says, you know, I just want to let you know there's a billion dollar market for this software or this, you know, product, consumer goods. Uh, I've figured out a way to trim efficiency by 3.1 percent all this stuff and we're hearing the pitch we're hearing the numbers they think they're giving us everything they want to hear and we're like okay why, why'd you start the company like we're asking simple questions and they're like well because of the market opportunity i knew that this was a great opportunity for an investor like you <laughs> and you're like no you're not answering the question why did you start this you know and you're trying to get to the purpose and most investors would never care enough to ask they they hear the pitches they don't give any feedback and they walk away and, and they never, the person never gets better at pitching. The company never gets funded. The investor never gets that cool investment they were looking for. And they both part ways. So I think with a better conversation, uh, if, if the founder can bring the conversation to the investor and feel like it's valid, I think the, the investor, even if they're the most ruthless money oriented investor, they're, they're going to calculate the risk that was just taken off the table. That's the cool part. Even if you get past or suspend the human side of it, right? The human care. This person is, a, a, objectively speaking, a sociopath. This investor, <laughs> they will understand that their investment is so much more secure. It's the smart thing. And I think more and more investors are, are, are catching on to this. So said another way, there's no shortage of smart people. There's no shortage of people that are proficient at something. There's also no, no shortage of excited people. There is... <laughs> a definitive shortage of people that are connected to meaning. And so in their business, in their product, they have proficiency, excitement, 
and connection to meaning. And it's really a result of the things that we talked about earlier, where society, this entire experience is not, we're not familiar with, we don't become familiar with ourselves to then become familiar with our purpose, to then build that into the business. There's only a, a tiny fraction of, of entrepreneurs that have actually gotten there. And the thing, practically speaking, and this may seem obvious, but it should, should be stated anyway, the reason why the investor is so, um, should be at least so connected to that being required in the investment is that when, not if, but when, the many, many, many months of frustrating product development that fails, financial struggles and so on, when that does happen, that meaning is the only thing that will sustain that entrepreneur. That is why, like you said, those four startups with those four entrepreneurs where passion and proficiency were existing in all four, but only one of them had the purpose. That's why that's the investment. And everyone else is dropping out like flies. They all saw the opportunity. They all saw the cool thing and they all took a shot at it. And the people that quit first are the ones that didn't have that connection to it. Um, and that actually gets us to the point of exponential ventures. The people that we're investing in are we call founders, uh, entrepreneurs, founders of companies. And we've taken a whole different approach um, to what we see going on typically in maybe Silicon Valley or venture capital companies where they seem to really invest in ideas, maybe a product, maybe a, a developed idea, but it's still a content piece. Uh, whereas the context seems to be more important uh, for the investment and the context is the founder, the person who is bringing this to life, the person who's running it, the person who's going to grow it, who's going to be there dedicated to it full time, day in, day out. And so we've taken a whole founders first uh, approach to investing where we feel the founder is more important than the idea. Uh, because there's certain times also what happens in Silicon Valley, I'll make some comments on it and then I want to get your feedback. But what happens in Silicon Valley typically is the founder, this is the dream scenario for a founder. So you go to Silicon Valley, you get funded, you're so excited, your company starts to grow, you start to scale it up, and very quickly, you know, you realize, wow, like I've made it. There was nine other people, there was 10 of us, and I was the only one who got funded, and then I was, you know, I was able to grow the business a bit and stuff like that. I'm the dream scenario for any person going to try to make it big. And that person typically gets fired from the company and replaced by someone who's more senior, more experienced. Uh, the company now has got to a certain level where the people that invested don't trust the founder. Uh, so, so they're actually a, a, a resource that's temporary for the business in order to get it to the spot where the company needs to take it over. And they're like, you know, pat little Jimmy on the head or little Susie and say, thank you so much for doing this. We're going to take it over here. Let the adults do this now. And that's the power dynamic that starts with the pitch. And it's the one that finishes with the founder getting fired. And that's the best case scenario. Uh, the other, so that person then gets disillusioned and then they come to someone like us and we figure out, oh wow, you actually were really onto something big there. You probably could have scaled a lot more, couldn't you? Uh, what would you have needed to make that successful? And what's this next company you have? We'd love to talk about that. But so there's, there's those 10% of people that were successful that got booted or disillusioned in some sort. Maybe they're golden handcuffs for five years or something. Um, investing you know in their company and actively it's almost like being fired um but being kept around as a little um jail sentence for the last five years of your work where they don't really need you but they have to pay you so you have to come uh, all that stuff um, but then there's the nine other founders or the 90 percent of other founders who went tried to make it big tried to get an investment got maybe a few thousand bucks uh, as an investment, told all their friends and family, we've been invested in by this big accelerator. Can't believe it. This is our big shot. And then realized no one's paying attention to me anymore. No one will even answer my emails. What's going on here? And do you want to talk a bit about the Hunger Games? <laughs> yeah. And ironically, they're probably the lucky ones, right? That actually got out um, with a failed business and went on, created another one and, and probably hopefully didn't take capital uh, from. And I, I think the vast majority of the 10% that you referred to, they get five years out, you ask them, what's your main regret? Regret. I think the majority are going to say taking any capital. Mm -hmm. You know, looking at the founder who now owns 3% of it, the company that they started and has no job and is sitting on the outside looking in. Um, you know, many can talk about the opportunity, the experience, now the connections and so on, and probably take that into the next business and I bet you do it very differently. So the other part, the other nine out of 10, so I guess 
the easiest um, framework to consider is an accelerator type scenario where you take 10 startups, maybe 20, 24 founders, you put them through a three month cohort. It's essentially a Hunger Games where you know the LPs are the fund manager on behalf of the LPs and then the mentors or advisors that are typically not present, they're hiding in the corner, they don't wanna do the work. Uh, they've taken the, the role f for their resume. Uh, are watching, first of all, they're, they're taking 10 startups at various uh, levels of development. They're ramming them into a completely prescriptive, you know, formula of 12 weeks of content. And, you know, when you have a customer development question at week one, no, 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 wait till week nine. That's when we talk about customer <laughs> development. The whole thing is, is absurd well, on no, its we face. Need, we need to tell you, you're on, you know, you're three years into your company or over a million dollars. We need you to talk about logo design and branding <laughs> yeah. for the first like three weeks. Yeah. You know, and you're like, this doesn't meet my needs at all. Like, but they're trying to give us standard education. It's they're just reproducing the education problem in the education world into the startup world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and really, like so many conspiracies, I think the players within it don't understand what's actually happening. But what's actually happening? So, in, a, in other words, I just want to be clear: there's a lot of really great people on accelerators that are trying to add as much value as they can. Yet they are complicit unwittingly in this in this game, and it is a Hunger Games type scenario. Because of the VC-led, you know, startup paradigm, which, uh, so again, again, this should be very obvious, but it's worth saying, a VC-led paradigm means that the rules have been created to enrich VCs at the expense of most of the other stakeholders. And at the, to the greatest extent, uh, the greatest expense, in my opinion, are the founders. So this example of an accelerator. Which we believe are the value creator. They are the most important component. The value creator, not even the value, the valuable asset, it's the value creator. Mm -hmm. So it's it, literally the hub of all the value that's created. And without that, nothing else can happen. And so, and so they're willing to sacrifice that to try to get toward their end, which... Because their thesis is 10%. The VC-led startup paradigm is that you invest in 10 and one succeeds. So what ends up happening, consciously and unconsciously, is that all the people, the fund manager, the LPs, the advisors, the sponsors, everyone, starts to, to predict who is the one out of the 10 that's gonna make it. In the 10, who's the one Uber? Or maybe even, a, a let's say, a larger accelerator, you have four co cohorts. Who's the one or two out of 40? And then what they do is they begin to, again, consciously and unconsciously, wittingly and unwittingly, begin to marginalize, abandon, and neglect the ones that they don't think have the DNA of the next you know, unicorn. Um, the tragic part of that, in my opinion, and I, I do see it as, as part cowardice, even if it's unintentional, is that you have real humans that, that are sometimes purposeful, maybe just not in the right market, or the product's too early for the market, that are just slowly, as I said, abandoned and neglected. And I think any human can feel the pain of what that's like when you're seeking advice, comfort, information, and people aren't even responding to emails. And, and again, the advisors are just not present. So that, that entire uh, you know, paradigm is exactly how it works right now. And we see these people getting chewed out of Silicon Valley, sometimes coming to Toronto, sometimes going to other places and starting to think a little bit more global uh, about where the opportunities are. Uh, where the system isn't the exact same and where they can have a, a voice or a better shot because they've seen their friends succeed and they've seen their friends fail and they don't really see any path of what they actually want there. Um, so when we see those person, those people come to us, they have told us things about you know the idea that failed and we'll listen to it and we'll be like, oh, it sounds like actually a really cool idea. Why did it fail? And they're like, well, the timing wasn't right. It seems like it'll probably work like three years from now. It's just people weren't ready for it, so not a good product market fit. And we're like, oh, that's a very reasonable reason for a business not to work out or for an idea. We're like, but you seem awesome. What's your next idea? Uh, or do you have another idea? Because we actually have some pretty crazy stuff on the shelf. Uh, things, big problems that we think the world needs to solve. <laughs> uh, and that's where our meaning becomes infused with theirs. And it's like, listen, if we have you know, 17 sustainable development goals identified as the, from the United Nations on the biggest problems in the world to solve. Maybe we can chip away at one of those. Like, do, do any of them align with what you're up to? Uh, how do we solve a problem, not just for ourselves to make some money, but solve a problem for everyone forever? And then people seem to get pretty excited about that and just know that they have an investor. And we're investors, we're advisors. Uh, we have connections to service providers, connections to those other groups. Uh, and just to know that someone's in their corner looking out for that for them 
and wants to see them in that kind of position and then customize a business around them. It seems to be revolutionary, which we didn't realize was actually that revolutionary because when we did a lot of research on other incubators, accelerators and VCs and stuff, we just couldn't find many that would align with this. Uh, literally, we realized that we would be, we have a, a jail threat. You know, so literally, if we were to make certain decisions that benefit the founder, there's a legal repercussion for that. Do you want to talk about that? About the idea of B Corps or uh, writing into your corporate structure, mm -hmm. the ability to make founder first decisions or even environment first. Mm -hmm. You know, what prevents the CEO from dumping a bunch of waste into the, into the ocean or something yeah. like that? Yeah, and again, we come back to a VC-led sort of paradigm and maybe a hyper-capitalistic mindset just in business in general. So these are ideas that very few people actually question, which is incredible when you think about it. The reality is, is that corporations are sociopaths in law in that, that most states and most provinces and most countries where you can incorporate, the sole requirement of the corporation is to enrich the shareholder. And so without really thinking first, and again, very fortunate we can even have this conversation, and I realize, we realize that over time, this is, founders are gonna begin, and we ask them to think about this, and they're, they're typically taken aback. We ask them, what sort of organization would you like to create? What do you mean, just go online, Delaware, incorporate, and good to go, right? No, not exactly. So if you do that, you have no right to do anything other than enrich your shareholders. Is that what you want? Whoa, what do you mean? Yeah, there's something called ecology and community and, and also cash, you know, the people, planet, profits. Do you want to be entitled to making decisions on behalf of the planet and the people? Yeah, cool. Then we need to create that, you know, preferably from the beginning, especially if you're going to take on investment, lose board seats and lose control, essentially. So, yeah, I, I, you know, and again, this goes to startups with meaning are very powerful. They're more profitable. And again, investors may... You know, if they're not conscious and not really thinking about their interests, may become uncomfortable. Once they realize that the, the startup is animated in a way that it couldn't otherwise be animated and more stable, more secure and moves faster, they want, you know, the startup to, to declare up front what they're legally entitled to there. And the reason I mentioned the jail time is because we've had a lot of pushback from people thinking, no, it can't be like that. And, and so we've had to kind of make it more bold or more in your face and we're like, well, just so you know, you could be thrown in jail uh, for not meeting your fiduciary responsibility as a CEO of a company that these investors wanted to be enriched and you made a decision that didn't give them the best ROI on, the, on that decision. And you went and did something that was, maybe you did good. You know, you literally did something that was in your heart exactly what you felt you should do. Probably 90% of society would also say that that was the right decision, but you actually broke the law. And now you're in trouble. And now you owe those people an explanation. You know, you owe the authorities explanations. You could be taken to court over this. And you're not going to be able to defend it, let alone run the company. So how do we recreate the organization at the early stages so we don't have to end up in that scenario? And that seems to be something that uh, they seem <laughs> to be more open to discussing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, the example that you alluded to is the best example. So in some states, it may not be illegal to take toxic materials and dump it in the, the river. Um, it's always legal for you to enrich the shareholders, always required, pardon me. It's illegal for you to not do that. So in many states, in many countries, therefore, you must, in law, by law, dump that material into the river. If that's the best financial outcome for yeah. the company. Yeah. Which, and, and it doesn't break any laws. And most founders, when you, when you actually ask them to contemplate that, and again, obviously the human the feeling human is abhorred by that idea. But when you put it up in front of them as objective fact, you know, we now have a very different conversation. Yes, I would love the right to not dump the waste into the river. Well, you need to actually create that right. That right's not naturally afforded to you. Mm -hmm. So blended corpse, B corpse, triple bottom line corpse, um, are, and even just bylaws, taking an existing corp, creating bylaws that allow you to protect people and planet that give you the ability to make investments and and, and or just not do terrible things <laughs> that, <laughs> that happen to be legal uh, is what we want our founders to, to have for sure. Yeah. Um, one of the last things that I wanted to talk about was corporate culture and how 
the organization blooms after you have this really powerful seed where there's a founder. Um, and, and I think, always think of like uh, the, the example of an oak tree. The organic nature of an oak tree is all encapsulated within an acorn. And then that kind of blooms over time, turn everything's in there that needs to be there. So we think of architecting the creation of acorns like that, the creation of startups that can scale exponentially into an oak tree, you know, naturally, the way, the way it naturally does with a little bit of water, a little bit of sun. So for the founder, once we have this awesome founder who's connected with their extreme proficiency in a certain area, amazing passion about it, uh, that's connected to their meaning, and what they're actually here to here to do. Then we have the challenge of like, well, how do you build an organization around that? And some people would say like, oh, you can't do it. You know, like, you know, just get a bunch of people and <laughs> make it work. Like that's where it ends. That's where the fun part ends. And we don't believe that that's true. We think that's where it really begins. If you want to create an awesome corporate culture, then first of all, that guy for Thrive, like if I was a, an employee that was looking for a place to work, I would have joined that day that I heard him tell that story. I would have been like, holy crap, like this sounds amazing. I get the mission. I get the, what the guy's about. I want to work for a place like that. And I figure like he's going to be a good guy to work with, <laughs> you know, just by nature. And so I think you attract. So do you want to talk about um, corporate culture and kind of where you think it's headed for things like this? Well, the first word you use, attract, it's literally attractive, right? It's magnetic. Have you ever been around someone that is just so you know, in love with an idea that, that when, they, when they talk about it, you just want to hear more? You're naturally, you know, they, let's, they love adventure travel and they're talking about a trip to like Mongolia and then they're talking about the jungle and they're talking about how the government got involved and they just pull you right in and you're begging for more. And I think that's, that's in the future, if we end up in the utopian version of the future, we end up with a pile of organizations that have this in their core as a requisite, it is required that no one, and I think, you know, not to stereotype or be unfair, but we see millennials demanding more in the workplace. And everyone, not just millennials. We are slowly waking up to the fact that jobs are likely a failed experiment, that we as humans, our, our basic human needs are not met by the typical nine to five job in, a, in, a, in an office environment, a factory environment, in any environment. And what, what we need or what we've been trying to isolate and kind of silo is we have meaning on the weekends and the evenings, so with our family and our hobbies and so on, and then we go to work and we trade this time for that. And why, when, and how we divorced meaning from work uh, is still a bit of a mystery to me, but I'm sure it goes back to factory work. Mm -hmm. That idea is really, let's create pieces that include humans on lines that do put other pieces and other pieces, and then we reward them with money and they go out and buy whatever they buy. But what we're beginning to wake up to, I think this reality is, is that not only is that not necessary, but the organizations that are impressing us the most as consumers um, and just participants in the year 2018 on planet Earth are the ones that put meaning and the why in front of them. But, you know, they they not only, they're, 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 they have no, they're unapologetic in communicating exactly why they're doing what they're doing. And that's what's led to observations such as people don't buy what you're doing or even how you're doing it, they buy why you're doing it. Right. They, they themselves, humans I think, are just starved. And so therefore, because probably we've just allowed ourselves permission now as individuals and as groups to demand meaning. We're so starved of meaning <laughs> that we will literally buy a consumer product because we think there's meaning there yeah. just to connect to meaning. Yeah, so the marketers, is traditional marketing, is to try to drum up a desire, you know, use the Maslow's hierarchy of needs to try to, you know, attack your self-esteem so that you feel like you can get meaning out of this product. And this lipstick with this beautiful woman on the ads. My kids, I taught my kids uh, um, how to walk through the mall and identify all of that just on a little day camp thing one time where we'd walk through and they went store to store. After 10 minutes, they had the ability to walk down and say, Oh, the music store. So if you buy their music, then you'll get friends. And I was like, yeah, you see the big picture with all the friends around there? And, stuff like that? and they're like, yeah, that's not true. And I, well, I said, like, do you think it's true? Do you think it'll happen? And they're like, no, it's just music. And I'm like, yeah, it's a little sneaky, isn't it? And they're like, yeah, it's really sneaky. 
And they're like, do all companies do that? And I'm like, well, what's this next one doing? They see the lingerie store with the beautiful woman. Oh, if you buy this underwear, then you're going to be beautiful like her. Yeah, that's what they're saying. And people are doing that. Does that seem like a good reason to get underwear? <laughs> you know? They're like, well, it's just underwear. And I'm like, yeah, I know, it's right. Um, so it's, it's a very obvious thing to a kid to even see the game that's going on with marketing. What if we actually created real, valuable, meaningful products and services that did add meaning to people's life, that did help their self-esteem, or that did actually do what the marketers are tricking people into thinking? That's what the new companies are starting to create, is really valuable, meaning-based stuff in the world that allows people to get on with their day. Even if it's something simple that saves you a little bit of money, that could be meaningfully made in the world. And then truthfully sold. So where, where you're just being transparent with why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, I think I think the evolution in advertising and marketing, like the things you were saying about the music and the clothes, or the underwear in that case, uh, were basically manipulations of social, social psychology and kind of human behavior. And now, and it may be that we're becoming smarter as consumers, and it may just be that we're becoming more evolved as humans and saying, hey, let's not play games. Instead, let's be explicit. So... You know, Tom's buy one, give one away. Um, a lot of uh, Patagonia has. Yeah, the one for one model with Tom's, that's what you're referring to, where it's like if you buy one product, then we'll give one product as a donation to mm-hmm. someone in need. Or uh, there's a sock company that does one for one also, which is like if you buy a pair of these awesome snazzy socks that are kind of superfluous, we'll give a pair of these really hardy, like well designed socks to, um, to a homeless shelter. And they've given over a, a million pairs of socks to homeless shelters and then so you feel that in the in the marketing now they're just saying transparently what we're going to do and they've promised it in their company um, which then protects them i guess to be able to continue to do this in the future if they have a new investor that joins and it's like oh we could get rid of all these free socks you're giving away and make a lot more money <laughs> it's like actually it's core to our business that's why people buy our socks that that model when executed authentically because I think there's a lot of copycats and people that see it as just a good model. Mm-hmm. So the contribution, and it could be 10% to say rainforest in Latin America, it could be give one away, whatever that thing is needs to resonate with the market. So the product and then the social impact offering needs to resonate. And when that's done properly, a startup wins, obviously. The consumer wins because they're connecting to the meaning. The startup is kind of the the accelerant or the catalyst of this sort of social, you know, innovation, so, so, social contribution. Obviously, the recipient of the contribution benefits. Yeah. And then, and we go back to the original conversation or one of the conversations a few minutes ago. The investors benefit; their investment becomes more secure. And this is a great example of where we remove the absolute pressure for absolute enrichment of the shareholder. You know, so a financial amorality where we just say it's all about cash. And we see a very good example of stable, secure, scalable businesses that have very consciously, intentionally put out front of them some sort of ecological or community contribution. Mm -hmm. So why this is so important is because everything we've talked about, it's all about scaling impact. That's what the whole podcast is about. Scaling on that side of it, we have people that are obsessed with growth and exponential technologies and uh, figuring out how to just scale things, sometimes for the heck of scaling it. And we want to challenge those people to find a little bit more meaning in what they're doing. You know, once you've scaled and sold a company, it loses some meaning. So we want to challenge those people to find more fulfillment, more passion, more alignment with what they're doing. And then the impact side of it is all about, you know, there might be nonprofits or charities or people, just big hearted people that haven't kind of been able to get the business savvy element or just the mechanics of how to scale their solution to a broader market. And sometimes that takes fuel, which is profit. Oftentimes you need an organization that has a profit margin in order to scale it, uh, you know, profits fuel for the mission, Uh, not the mission. So I think wrapping that up, that's kind of where I wanted to leave off. And is there any comments that you had before we end off? I think it's a great way of summarizing it. I think if... As I said, we don't even know why we're here, but if we could imagine for a minute that the purpose may be to find the purpose and realize that we're at the core of that. It's our responsibility. If we wanna scale anything, scale cash, scale community, scale ecology, it really is up to us to connect ourselves to the meaning around that and then give that out to the group and allow it to proliferate in that way. 
Well, thanks for coming on. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We take every listener to this podcast very seriously, and we'd love to keep in touch with you directly. So please subscribe to our Scaling Impact community by subscribing to our email list at exv.ai forward slash podcast. That's exv.ai forward slash podcast.